good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to hear um, familiar voices. Uh, we have quite um, a um, packed program, so let's start on the hour, and it's the hour. Uh, so I'm um, welcoming everyone. My name is uh, Stephanie, for those who don't know me, and I am with the Seed and Knowledge Initiative, uh, one of your hosts today. And we, so we, let's begin, and let's begin with a few housekeeping matters uh, for a smooth running of the webinar. So I'll end over to my colleague, uh, Nick, uh, for uh, housekeeping matters. Over to you, Nick. Thank you, Stephanie. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicholas Mulver, and I am a communications officer in the Sky Regional team. I'll be providing technical support for today's webinar. Um, so please feel free to reach out to me in the chat if you have any concerns or issues. Uh, before we start, I just want to cover a few important things to note for today. Um, now, most participants will by now have had some experience with online meetings and webinars. It's the world we live in at the moment. Um, so I do ask, please all keep your microphone muted and your video off unless explicitly indicated otherwise by the facilitator. Um, I will be pleasing this a little bit, so please don't take offense if you unmute yourself and you get muted again. Um, it's just in order to keep the webinar running smoothly with as many attendees as there are. Uh, due to limited time, we do not have a really a formal question session planned, so I encourage you to engage with the content and each other via the chat. And of course, please remain appropriate and respectful. Uh, if possible, uh, please provide your full name um, and if applicable, your organization as well. Uh, you can do this by, um, you can change your name as a function in, in Zoom. Um, this will also help us when assigning attendees to breakout rooms for the final session on our agenda. Please note the option in the upper right corner of your Zoom window that allows you to change between speaker view and gallery view. Um, this will, as I mentioned, it, it will change how you see the speakers if they are talking to you. As with any webinar, there's always the possibility of technical and connection issues. If such issues do arise, we ask that you remain patient as we troubleshoot. This webinar will be made available on the Sky YouTube channel, so participants who may be struggling with a poor connection or need to leave unexpectedly can access the recording once it has been uploaded. Thank you, and back to you, Stephanie. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Nick. And really don't hesitate if you've got any... Um, uh, tech problems or you're not sure about uh, anything uh, to, to chat to Nick in the chat box or, or even to everyone. Thank you. So once again, um, on behalf of uh, Sky, welcome um, everyone to this first uh, introductory webinar to agroecology. Um, Sky is a regional partnership of 16 organizations in Southern Africa. Um, that aims at promoting farmer-led seed system and agroecology in the region, because we believe um, this is the only way to restore balance and justice in our food system and also in our relationships with um, the rest of the planet. And by doing so, uh, achieving uh, sustainable food and nutrition security. Uh, Sky partners are mostly um, local organizations based in the communities or local NGOs with a really long-standing uh, work experience with um, small order farmers, but also advocacy organizations and research institutions. Uh, if you want to know more about Sky, I invite you to go to our Sky website. Um, uh, we will screen um, the, the address a bit later on in, in the webinar. But one of our objectives um, uh, as Sky is, is to go beyond this little club of uh, Sky AE practitioners and reach to all the other audiences, uh, first and foremost farmers. Uh, we really believe that this agroecology movement uh, should be led by farmers, but also all the people working with the farmers, the agricultural practitioners, um, uh, other sectors like government people and also other sectors like um, uh, the environment, health, education, social welfare, you name them. And simply any uh, citizen who is concerned by, by the state of our food system and, and the state of our environment. Um, because if we want to, 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 to see our wish transforming into um, um, uh, reality, uh, the food system to become more sustainable uh, by becoming an agroecological food system, we need the majority of, of the society to be on board, the majority of the people who, 
um, are, are involved in a way or another, and we are all involved because we all need food for um, for our lives, and and um, and we don't want to compromise also the health um, of our families and the health of the, the planet uh, and, the, and the future of our children. So we really think um, uh, we can. And get you as ally to 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 our, our vision, and so this series of webinars um, is within this framework. Um, it's uh, really first and foremost to reach out to new audiences, uh, to explain, to um, uh, raise interest, awareness, and hopefully uh, uh, gain you as allies. But we have also this objective of uh, running a longer course, a more in-depth uh, experiential course um, next year in July 2021. Um, and so this, these webinars are also a way of getting to know one another, explore the interest in this uh, long course. Um, and um, and um, yeah, see, see whether some of you would be interested after the webinars to, to to come and join us in um, uh, a leading an agriculture movement in Southern Africa. But to know more about the course, I invite my colleague Alfreda to, to, um, to explain a bit more the thinking um, behind uh, this uh, course idea. Over to you, Alfreda. Okay, hi everybody. Good morning, this afternoon. Um, and thank you for joining all of us. So I'm just going to give a little bit of an overview of why why this course. Um, I think everybody uh, um, everybody's joined this webinar today because you worried about agriculture or you think that the current system that we have is not really working for farmers. Um, so I think over decades actually people have been introducing alternative um, different alternative practices of agriculture like permaculture organics um, and there's a number of them um, in you know as an alternative to industrial um, agriculture because yeah we're just looking for alternatives and I think in the process we've just really learned uh, we've learned a lot um, we've improved a lot our practices um but i think to i think it's just it's still really in isolated pockets and, and it hasn't really grown and i think for myself as um being involved in sky for since 2013 i just one day realized that there's there's a group of people some of them are here today that have been trained many years ago at Fambitsanai in permaculture so it's like a um, we're still relying on them, you know, like the same group. And it's like there's not a younger uh, the generation. There are a few people, but it's um, few and far in between. Um, and it's really, um, like for, it dawned on me that it, there's really a need to, to train, to have agroecology experts um, in Southern Africa, in Africa as a whole. Um, I think the other thing that's also just with the rise of La Via Campesina, the um, you know peasant movement, global peasant movement, um, they've really coined agroecology as a movement, and it um, and it's very clear that it needs to be that if we want to scale it up and spread it, and also if we want to change policies um, and just. Um, sort of stop the tide of, of negative impact of industrial agriculture and, and also climate change that is really hitting Southern Africa. Um, so I think we all realize that, that it's really important and that agroecology in a way is an umbrella term. Um, I mean, there will be more discussion about why and what agroecology means, but it's just an umbrella term for um, different practices, but with some common principles around um, biodiversity and um, which all things that will be discussed later on. Um, so we have realized that it's just really important to have to have a, a group of people in um, Southern Africa who understand agroecology well and who can be leaders um, and who can lead the movement. And that is um, um, 
our um, sort of overall goal, I can just or purpose for the course is really to strengthen the attitude, knowledge, and skills in agroecology activists towards them playing a greater leadership role in the agroecology movement in Southern Africa in a way that um, captures the overall um, purpose of it. Um, we've also realized there are some courses. There's a two-year course at Fambit and I at the moment. Not everybody can do that those two years. And there's sort of one-week courses that are often just dipping into um, the issue and then people go home and have to try and practice it. So we were thinking well, we need something in the middle, something that's much more in-depth um, for people to have a really good understanding. And then, of course, um, for them to be part of a bigger group um, of agroecology practitioners where we create an ongoing, I think our ambition and intention is that it's not a once of course, but that there will be um, a community of practice or a, at least a, a, some sort of community of practitioners that can continue to learn um, from each other. Um, so the idea with the course is that to have a one month course um, and some of the sort of principles that we've developed is that it's um, is that we want it strongly experiential, um, which is really towards shifting people's mindsets and approach to life. Ensure that there's a strong linkage um, with farmers and learning on the ground. Also, we think it's really important that in such a course, we, le we learn how to, how to transfer knowledge or exchange knowledge with others. Because I think often the way we work with farmers is, um, is very top down. So there's, um, uh, will be an emphasis on how to, the how of, of, of transferring knowledge or exchanging knowledge. Um, yeah, and then also, um, I think there will be an emphasis on really um, what we say, head, heart, and feet. So people's thinking, emotions, and will, and intention. So that it's, um, I think you really come out at the other end as somebody that's um, fully um, sort of converted to, to agroecology. So, um, so that's some of the attention. And then of course, um, lots of practical activities and something. Um, there's a whole scientific and technical side to agroecology that will be very strong. Um, oh, so that's just a really brief overview. And I just want to conclude that the big thing is, I think the big intention, what we really need in Africa is leaders. We need wise leaders, we need capable leaders. Um, and we need passionate and committed leaders. Um, and this course is really aimed at developing that leadership um, of people across the spectrum who have a vision to spread and implement and just change the course of agriculture in Africa, but also um, to heal the communities and the ecosystems that we depend on. Um, yeah, that's my summary. There's a lot more, of course, but I think it will come out and you can also ask questions um, as we discuss the different aspects of um, agroecology. So these webinars, like Stephanie said, is really, the course will start next year, but it's really to try and get people interested, to start exploring the concepts um, and also for ourselves and for everybody that's, that's attending um, to take it to see exactly what it is um, we are going to um, achieve with this um, course. Thank you, and that's all from me. Thanks, thanks very much, Alfreda. Um, yeah, no, I think it, it's quite clear, the, the rational, the reason, the vision, uh, the specificities of that course uh, compared to the other ones that are already there in the region and, and also a bit of the modalities. So I think in each webinar, we'll have the opportunity to discuss again um, the, the longer course and especially the last one, but also um, we'll have further thoughts to share. Um, but let's begin with this uh, first um, introductory webinars. Uh, before I get to the program, I just would like 
to introduce very briefly the rest of the team that is behind the organization of this series of webinars. Uh, it is actually the team in the Sky Committee of Practice um, that is developing the course, the long-term course that also designed uh, the series of webinars. And it's a team comprising of uh, Nelson Mozingwa from Zimsoft, John Zira from Ukubuna, Lawrence Mkalipi from Bauer South Africa, Vanessa Black from Bauer South Africa, Shepard Mutsingwa from Fambizanai Permaculture Center in Zimbabwe, Chifundo Kokwa, Skok Malawi, uh, Jackie Van Nierke from UCT, Precious Piri from Regeneration International, uh, and I hope I'm not forgetting anyone, and from the Sky team, Elfrida and myself, with the support also of John Wilson. For this specific first webinar, um, it was mostly Vanessa Chifundo, Precious, John and myself um, to, to design this one. And behind the scene, of course, uh, we could not do this uh, work without the support of uh, Ruby, who uh, you got in contact with through your registration process, uh, and also Nick for all the communication and technology aspects. So that's the team. Um, but also I want to acknowledge the rest of the Sky family. I can see some of them being there to support us. Uh, Esther, um, Jackie, um, Maya, Annie, um, Gertrude. Um, so it's nice to, to, to have you also supporting us in this, um, in this uh, effort. Uh, and finally, I would like to acknowledge you, the participants. Uh, thank you so much for, for, for joining today. From the registration process, we, um, we received a lot of interest. Uh, I think there were uh, altogether 55 registrations that came in and much more expressions of interest. And we have uh, people from six countries in Africa, two countries outside of Africa, and um, people uh, ranging from um, farmers, practitioners, entrepreneurs, uh, students, and, and just uh, concerned citizens. So quite a, a variety of, of people, and this is exactly what we were expecting. So thank you very much and welcome again. We look forward to engaging with you. Um, now the program, so I'm going to share a PowerPoint presentation. Um, I guess this one. Um, yeah. So I hope uh, everybody can see my screen. Um, so this is the first webinar of a series of three, uh, and the aim of the aim of that one is really to give you a taste of what agroecology is all about, and also um, uh, set the scene. Um, so the other two webinars are going to go much deeper into the main key pillars of agroecology. Uh, so today is just um, um, giving you uh, an idea of what it is and, and why. Uh, but we hope at the end of the series, you have like, quite a clear picture and you will, um, you will consider joining the course or the AE movement in any other way. So the focus today is why agroecology and what agroecology means. Um, so we'll, we'll start with a session Okay, so we've done the welcome. We'll start with a session um, where Chifundo is going to share a compilation uh, of your understanding of agroecology um, um, for the moment. Uh, and it, we received quite interesting um, uh, definitions and diagrams. So we wanted to put that back to you. And then Vanessa is going to um, give us a, um, a presentation on uh, a brief history of agroecology and also sharing uh, a few official definitions. Then we get into a session about why agroecology now. So uh, again, a presentation and also uh, some, some, some videos, including a video on the views, the perspectives from the farmers, because first and foremost, um, we want the farmers to be leading the aid movement and, 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 and agroecology is very important for their practice. Uh, then uh, we'll have a session on exploring the breadth of agroecology. Uh, so how agroecology relate to um, the indigenous knowledge, uh, to science and, and other forms of knowledge, uh, to nutrition and biodiversity. Um, also the link between agroecology and localizing food system, uh, the inclusion of youth 
um, in agroecology, um, the agroecological perspective on gender and inclusivity, looking um, at uh, the landscape level, uh, agroecology landscape. And finally, also um, uh, just sharing on the need for scaling agroecology in a transition process. Then we'll finish with a wrapping up and we will ask you to be the main actors of this wrapping up. Uh, we will have um, a group session. So you will break you into groups and Nick, um, when, when, when we come, come to that session, is going to explain to you how we're going to do that. Uh, where we'll ask you in smaller group to, to reflect on the learnings um, you got from the sessions, but also the questions you may still have or the new questions that might have arise from, from the presentations and um, the videos. So it's really just to, to make sure that you follow well and just while you're going through the webinar, just think about, okay, oh, this is something new for me or I never thought about that aspect, but, but why, but how? So also write down all the questions. Then you can share in the session, the group session and back into plenary, we ask the rapporteurs to share um, key points, key learnings and key questions. And then, um, yeah, we'll also have maybe a few minutes to talk about the next webinar and also preparing for the next webinar. So this is our program for today. You see quite packed. We'll have a break in between uh, at the end of the Why Agroecology Now session, uh, about 10 minutes so that people can also refresh um, and, and then we'll continue. So that's the program. Um, and I think with no further ado, I'll end over to Chifundo for uh, moderating the first session, uh, actually session two, what is agroecology? Over to you, Chifundo. And don't forget, you know, any questions, comment, use the chat box, even during, during, during the sessions. Sorry, over to you, Chifundo. Thank you, Steph. Um, I'll share my screen as well. Um, I hope we're able to see that. Not yet, Stifundo. It's not coming yet. Oh, okay. It doesn't look like it's coming, so maybe you need to do it again. Yes. There we go. It's coming. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, on your registration forms, uh, there was a section where you had to describe agroecology, what agroecology means to you. And uh, we were also asked to prepare some sort of diagram for what agroecology means to us. So uh, I compiled uh, quite a lot from the responses and um, I'll be sharing just a little bit because we received quite a lot. So I'll just share with you a few things that uh, came out from uh, your assignments. So, uh, Okay. So um, the first thing that came out was mostly that uh, agroecology is a means. Sorry, Chifundo, maybe you can uh, go into the uh, show screen because we are look, we are seeing all this the slide on the side. So if you can go to the um, slideshow mode. Okay. I'll start it from the beginning. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so the first thing that truly came out was that uh, agroecology is a means of production. Uh, everybody, almost everybody wrote that uh, it is some form of production, whether it's ag ag agriculture, some specifically said agriculture, some said producing food. And most of the pictures had uh, some form of production happening in the background. As you can see in that beautiful picture, it's taro production, but I think it's also mixed with other uh, crops. So uh, that's, that was the main thing that came out. The main thing that came, another thing that came out was also the quality of the food that is produced. Um, most people mentioned that the quality of food is better, it is more healthy. So we talked about healthy food, healthy water. And as you can also see in the picture, there was a lot of mention of healthy landscapes. And uh, another thing that came out mostly uh, was the interconnections, the interrelationships. 
uh, most people mentioned that um, there is uh, connections of people, animals uh, on the farm, whether in the water. So, and the soil also was a major component that was mentioned by most people. So there was a big um, move that everything is connected. There was a big feeling that everything is connected and that uh, any action of one will affect the whole system. So it really came out from the assignments. Um, the next thing that came out was that uh, agroecology is a practice. Most people talked about it being a practice with processes that people follow and uh, are able to produce in this system. Uh, we also had people mostly saying it was a study of something. So whatever it was, it was a study of whether it was ecosystems, agroecology, um, was a study of networks. So people talked about it being a learning um, a thing, like a learning system where people have to learn. So it was a lot of uh, issues on um, learning and being study, a study of something. Um, and the next one was, uh, a lot of people also talked about agroecology being a science. Um, so maybe two to three people said that agroecology was a science. And uh, the science, they, there was no explanation really on what the science was, but the word that came out, the key word was that it was a science. And uh, most also explained agroecology as um, restoring a balance uh, and healing the earth. Uh, you can see there that the mother earth has a band-aid on it. So people talked about um, agroecology being able to restore the balance as well as heal the earth, as well as restore um, what uh, the chemical systems are, are doing. That was uh, one thing that strongly came out. Uh, we also had uh, people talking about sustainability I think everyone had either a vision of the word, either sustainability, resilience, harmony with nature. Some people use the word regenerative, others use the word holistic. So it was a strong feeling that um, agroecology is sustainable or resilient or regenerative or holistic. So I think all of, almost all of the participants mentioned this. So, um, there was also a mention of uh, it being something that uh, also can produce income and for the social aspects. So uh, there was a, a strong pool that agroecology has an ecology aspect, an economy aspect and a social aspect that creates resilience and uh, feeds into the nutrition, the biodiversity and the income. And uh, the last picture that we have there is um, uh, a landscape one. Uh, most people talked about restoring the landscape. Um, and you can see in the picture there, uh, different types of uh, foods that are growing. There was a mention of the diversity that uh, is produced during um, agroecology and uh, the diversity, not in terms of food only, but in terms of the landscapes. So those are the major things that came out from uh, the assignments that we received. Um, maybe just as we go back to plenary, uh, what struck you about uh, what came out from uh, your assignments? Do you have a different understanding of agroecology than uh, came out into in this presentation maybe? Maybe we can have a, a short talk about that. Yeah, basically uh, break the rule of only communicating via the chat box. Yes. If somebody feels like, um, you know, you're, you're stricken by something you just saw, um, aspects you hadn't thought about, um, the art part, any, any reaction from Chifundo presentation, we have a bit of time for you to share. Um, just raise your hand um, and, and go ahead. Anything new, anything old, any aha moments? <laughs> but it was, it was, yeah, I think for us, it was very interesting to see um, how comprehensive your, your understanding is, is already. 
but also a different different emphasis from from different participants and also the way you presented this to us as some people were very very creative and it's, that's that's very interesting yeah okay somebody in the chat box is saying uh heather is saying loved all the illustrations indeed some people were very very creative yeah but yeah, the systemic approach, uh, the connection to me also comes up quite quite clearly from, from many diagrams. I don't know, Vanessa, or anyone else from the Sky team, your 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 reaction to, to, to these submissions. Maybe Chifundo, you can play it again a bit in the background. Okay. Give it like one or two more minutes. Okay. Oh, I have to stop sharing to be able to take it back. Sorry. It's fine. I can monitor the chat in the meantime. Okay. Um, yeah, somebody's saying. Um, Maybe something new for you, Daniel. Agroecology embracing. Um, Socio-ecological and economic discourse. Okay. Uh, Karin um, was struck by the, the different perspectives of something. Um, and that's why sharing ideas is so vital so that you, you form um, a, a better picture. Uh, can I add here? I found this one uh, an interesting diagram also because it encompasses a whole lot of different um, production techniques, but there's also some controversial ones in, and I think the diagram, diagram comes from the FAO. Um, so some of the um, production, production um, processes like conservation agriculture that have been um, a little bit infiltrated by the corporate sector and so some places um, promoted for example in South Africa conservation agriculture is promoted with herbicides which is not how we normally would see agroecology and so it's, it's yeah it's really good to look at all those different aspects and see what parts of them we agree with and what parts um, we don't agree with especially when they're being defined by some of the bigger institutions where there's a lot of lobbying pressure. Thanks, Chifundo. Yeah, this is definitely a nice one. Lots of room for interpretation and thinking. <laughs> Yeah, I love this diagram, if it's what was meant, but I, I love, it seems to be a band-aid on the earth um, and that agroecology um, represents us trying to heal the earth. Um, so I really love that. Yeah, I, I can jump in and speak to that because I, I put it together. That was the intention and um, I just wanted to explain the band-aid in the sense that it wasn't at the level of um, responding and just reacting, but really looking at the root causes and agroecology being a way of um, responding in a meaningful way. So I'll stop, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So maybe if there's no other reactions, I mean, you can still use the chat box, um, but we can maybe go to the next session. Thank you. 
Okay. Okay, so thanks very much, Fundo, and, and, and to everyone for contributing these beautiful uh, diagrams. And uh, next in our program is Vanessa to, to make a presentation on, of, on what is agroecology. Um, so over to you, Vanessa. Can you see my share screen? Yeah, perfect. I just came right. ahead. So I'm going to take us through what is agroecology in summary, starting um, with a brief history of agroecology. And for some reason, my um, screen is not changing. Hmm. Sorry, Steph, I'm not, it's not moving to the next slide. Yeah, maybe, Try yeah, again. I'll share and share again, yeah. Is it moving when you're not sharing? Um, it was, yeah. So okay. let me try again. Ah, there we go. So, the first mention of agroecology was um, as long ago as 1928 by an uh, agronomist who was talking about um, how insects and, and crops interacted. And then the next um, big mention of agroecology was a German ecologist who in the 1950s and 60s started writing about agroecology. Um, also in relation to soil biology, pest management, and the interactions between plants, plants and insects. Hmm. No, it doesn't want to go in. So yeah, I don't know. Steph, I don't know what to do. It's not wanting to move on. Um, when, when I did okay. my presentation, I had to use the end button. My Okay, it's we, we can see the next slide now. Yeah, it might be internet. And then as, as environmental activism started developing in the 1960s and 70s, um, science also started changing. And people started looking at, instead of sciences, sort of a very focused um, discipline looking at parts, they started looking at the connection between things more and systems thinking started developing and with that development in science looking um, developing into ecological science and the systems and interactions between things people also starting at ag agriculture in the same way and people started especially talking about um, agroecology or if the ecology of agriculture in terms of resisting the green revolution that was being promoted in, in the 1960s and 70s. And we'll talk more about that later. And then in the 1970s, an ecologist Odom introduced the idea of agroecosystems, not just individual um, farms on their own, but how all those farms together and landscapes together function as systems. And some of the um, characteristics of nat natural ecosystems that were looked at are things like inter interdependency, looking at the web of life in those ecological systems, self-regulation of systems, self-renewal, self-sufficiency, efficiency, so how nothing is wasted and every comes food for something else, and diversity. So all those principles of ecology started being applied to agro. And from that, agroecological science principles emerged. And these science principles also are used to this day in looking at the interactions in an agroecological system. So I've paraphrased them here. Um, 
as uh, and and just to make it more more easy to to look at and it includes things like returning organic waste to the soil, the waste from one thing being the food for something else, creating healthy living soil, conserving resources by designing closed loop, loop or circular processes, building functional diversity on the farm in the landscape above and below ground and in time and space. So looking at seasons, for example, and creating as many good connections in that system and letting nature do the work. So the, how, from then, um, agroecology developed further. So before it was more ecological science and people looking specifically at the agroecosystem from a, a production point of view. But in the late 90s and 2000s, it then developed into the movement of agroecology. And this developed specifically because people were reacting against the green revolution that had just become entrenched. And how that industrial model of agriculture wasn't addressing key, key issues in the world, particularly food insecurity. And in 1996, there was a huge summit um, held by the FAO on food and food insecurity. And at that meeting, there was a, a side summit organized by small scale food producers, rural workers, organizations, grassroots and community based social movements, who then started talking about a counter movement to this industrial model. And that was um, described as food sovereignty. And from there, they started organizing and formed something um, called the the IPC for food sovereignty, so uh, International Planning Committee for Food Sovereignty, which was formalized in 2003. And then after that, social movements met at a place called Mialeni in Mali, and developed a declaration on food sovereignty. And that was then put forward into the UN spaces as a, a counter view on what this industrial to this industrial model of agriculture that um, corporations and some of the countries that are aligned with corporations were putting forward. That then did further in that as part of food sovereignty, and I'll show you a definition of that now, um, where, where communities were try to, trying to take back um, control of the food system, the social movement then forward agroecology as the means to do that. So it's um, a key element in the construction of food sovereignty and a way to develop joint strategies to counteract the industrial um, agriculture system. And in 2015, those social movements came together again at Nialeni and put out a declaration of the International Forum for Agro Agroecology. So from um, the food sovereignty declaration, social movements and small scale producers, basically people working to produce the majority of food in the world, said that food sovereignty is the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced logically sound and sustainable methods, and their right to define their own food and agricultural systems that are based on local contexts and cultures. Then in the Nialeni Declaration on Agroecology, um, agroecology was expanded further as, and, and this, these are just some excerpts from quite a long document, and I'd really encourage everyone to go and, and read both of those declarations. So agroecology is seen as a way of life and the language of nature, and it's not a mere set of technologies or production practices. So it's not just applying things on farm in a very um, confined way, but rather it's a complete way of life and it cannot be implemented the same in all territories. It's based on principles that are learned from nature, but applied in local ways and uh, according to the lo local culture and climate geography. The declaration also talks about a common understanding of agroecology as a key element in the construction of food sovereignty, as I've mentioned. And it's practiced by small scale producers, and generates local knowledge, promotes social justice, nurtures identity and culture, and strengthens the economic viability of rural areas. 
And a very strong statement about agroecology being political because it requires us to challenge and transform structures of power in society. We need to put the control of seed, biodiversity, land and territories, water, knowledge, culture, and the commons in the hands of the people who feed the world, who actually produce the food. So it's a very um, political statement in that sense. It's not about tweaking the current system, it's about changing it radically. From that interaction and a lot of campaigning that's taken place, by social movements and organizations and people supporting um, this cause, agroecology has entered into big, the big UN spaces, um, particularly the, the food and agricultural organization. So there's constantly people um, campaigning to have agroecology taken up and promoted instead of the industrial food system. And through that process, the FAO has also adopted 10 elements of agro, agroecology, and these were negotiated with a lot of input from civil society and people's movements, but also, um, yeah, it's, it's sort of an agreed understanding of what agroecology is in the UN system. And that includes a lot of the social principles that were brought in through the social movements and looking at the whole food system, not just the production side. So it includes diversity, the need to co-create and share knowledge, so not to top, uh, top down knowledge sharing. It's looking for synergies, it's looking for efficiency in the system, recycling of resources, it makes um, our food system resilient, it's looking at human and social values and rights, particularly the whole range of human rights. It's about culture and food traditions in local areas, it's got a component of responsible governance and um, solidarity economies. So looking at that whole localizing of the food system and solidarity between producers and eaters. Of and then last year, after a lot of campaigning, um, agroecology has been put on the UN agenda and um, there's a stream of work on agroecology, but there was a, a high level panel of experts report that was put out last year. Um, I've highlighted um, the reports called agroecological and other innovations and I've highlighted the innovative, um, sorry, and, and other innovative approaches. And the innovative approaches were inserted by um, counter um, the pushback from the corporate sector. So those include some some things that aren't agroecology from our perspective. So the report is trying to take those uh, different viewpoints into account, but it does um, define agroecology in the way that we see it as both, as all three elements, the science, a set of practices and the social movements. So it says that those need to work together and be articulated together and co-evolve into a holistic approach. And I wanted to just highlight what it says about social movements in particular. In particular. So it says, agroecology is seen as a solution to current challenges such as climate change and malnutrition, contrasting with the so-called industrial model and transforming it to build locally relevant food systems that strengthen economic viability, particularly of rural areas, based on short marketing chains, fair and safe food production, and it supports diverse forms of smallholder food production, family farming, farmers and rural communities, food sovereignty, local knowledge, social justice, local identity and culture, and indigenous rights for seeds and breeds. Um, so, and, and that it notes that the um, social movement aspect, aspect of agroecology is becoming more prominent and important. So at this juncture, we'd like to show you a short video from um, the International Panel of Experts on Food. Nick can, um, I'll my share. Nick, you can share the short video. In the 1950s and 60s, the world saw an explosion of new farming technologies. This green revolution increased crop yields and promised us prosperity, but it also polluted soils and water marginalized small-scale farmers, and erased traditional crops and diets. As agricultural landscapes have become more and more uniform, 
wildlife habitats have been lost, creating the perfect conditions for dangerous diseases to spill over into human populations. So what now? Do we double down on intensive farming? More techno fixes to outrun pests and control our environment? Actually, the future of farming could be very different. Across the world, communities are converging around a simple but powerful concept, agroecology. Agroecology is a way of farming with nature, not against it. It builds resilience to climate change and disease outbreaks by combining different plants and animals based on farmers' knowledge of their local environments. Agroecology doesn't rely on chemicals to fertilize crops and fight pests. It relies on diversity, and diversity in the field means fresh and nutritious foods for communities. It provides secure livelihoods based on cooperation, solidarity, and short supply chains that retain value in the community. Agroecology is a different way of organizing food systems based on different principles. So do we stay trapped in the 20th century or can we embrace agroecology as the next evolution in food systems? Yes, thanks, Nick. Okay, so I think you have a good idea from the, the little video, but just to follow on. So from the scientific principles, agroecology has also adopted some social principles that were distilled in the FAO 10 elements, but are also seen more broadly within social movements and, and um, the organizations promoting agroecology. So in summary, some of those include that um, we apply ecological principles, we avoid dangerous agrochemicals and technologies, for example, GMOs. It's about ensuring sovereign sovereignty over our resources, encouraging active and equal participation of women and youth, building on traditional knowledge, local knowledge with ecological science and participatory farmer-led research. So it starts from our traditional knowledge, but then we add to that um, with a, a farmer-based science and, and science from, from elsewhere. And Maya will go into that. Um, it localizes by building producer-consumer relationships and short and fair distribution networks. It diversifies, it conserves and enhances agrobiodiversity. It organizes from the bottom up and promotes many small-scale family farmers and collective, collectives. So in a nutshell, it's a practice, a science, and a myth. Thank you. So that was um, an introduction to agroecology. Agri We're now going to go into our um, third session, which is why we need agroecology now. And we're going to start again um, with a short documentary snippet from a documentary that was made in 2004 called The Future of Food. But it's a, a very useful entry um, as an introduction to how we got to where we are now. Thanks, Vanessa. Just before we get there, I just want to uh, remind people, I hope you've, you've, you've started learning new words, new concepts, maybe um, seeing new connections between things and linkages. Um, maybe also it's sparking questions, so please write that down. Write them down in preparation for our group sessions, because there's a lot of information in Venice's presentation, and I'm sure um, you've, you've started to learn things. So just a reminder, and also use the chat box for any comments, any questions already. Uh, thank you. Okay, so why we need agroecology, I think that it gave us a good introduction to how we have the kind of agriculture that we see being um, um, promoted around the world, especially by companies that benefit from the package that's part of this green revolution um, package. So, in the 1960s, 
they started promoting um, seed that was hybridized and um, bred particularly to be high yielding seed or pr produce a lot of yield, but seed that required things like um, fertilizer and, a, and good irrigation. And then in the late 1990s, um, with the World Trade Organization allowing um, patenting on, on life, on living things, these same companies were then able to start um, putting patents on the seed that they were developing by inserting new genes or genes from somewhere else into the seed. And so um, hybrid seed then became gen genetically modified seed and they could then modify the, modify the seed to either produce the, the pesticide within them um, as shown in the, the clip or to be, um, to be, to be sprayed with um, herbicides so that the crop wouldn't die when you sprayed it with the chemicals. So the seed in a way is part of promoting the, the, the same chemical that the companies sell. And you saw the chemical companies then buying out seed companies around the world. So this whole package, this green revolution, green revolution package that started in the 1960s and now is being promoted in Africa as the new green revolution. Um, it's all part of a, a package that um, one refers to as being on an agrochemical treadmill, where um, you start using sprays, the, um, the, the um, weeds or the insects become um, impervious to those chemicals, and then you need to use stronger and stronger ones. So this whole system, the industrialized system, has become the center of a whole lot of intersecting crises. Um, from a health and nutrition crisis to a biodiversity crisis, it impacts on land water, it impacts on the seed that we have as farmers, it entrenches corporate power and is creating a whole lot of toxic pollution in the environment. Um, and that's the, the, what we see, these monocultures that are being promoted of just one crop um, over large expanses that are then controlled with um, chemicals. So I'll go into some of these things in more detail. Um, it's important to understand that in the system, food, which has a whole lot of very important, um, uh, it's, it's important to us in very many ways, from cultural practices to um, invoking memories, invoking our relationships between each other, in the industrial system, food becomes a product like a whole lot of other products that then go through this chain of production from inputs to production to processing, manufacturing, retail and consumption. And between all those steps, we have transport. And many times these products or the, the even um, the parts of the product are shipped all around the world. So we might grow something here and we export a raw commodity to be processed somewhere else. And then a final food product is um, imported back to us as a processed food. So this whole um, value chain, global value chain has a lot of impacts. Um, one of them, for example, is that in this commodity system, land is taken away, people are forced off their land, and this is very clear in what's called the soya republics in Latin America, where, for example, countries like Argentina, which were the bread baskets of their region, have now been converted to monocrop GM soya production using Roundup. So people have been forced off the land, there's no longer need for workers because the, the crops are aerial sprayed, and there's been a, a war where companies hire private militia to force people off the land. They migrate into migrate to cities with terrible consequences for, for people who are sprayed by Roundup and get ill. And this all feeds then into an export market, um, often feeding um, feedlot animals to produce um, processed and fast food like hamburgers. So it's, it's really, a very negative um, process for the on the land before. And this whole system then generates a lot of climate change emissions. So, um, people, 
in Kuluma. Sorry. <laughs> So different organizations have started looking at the climate change impact of this industrial agriculture system. And if you look beyond just the farm um, emissions which come from the fertilizer, etc., one also needs to look at land use change um, to convert to this monocrop agriculture or to livestock farming, the transport component, processing and packaging, the whole um, freezing and, and the way one has to preserve food in order to transported such long distances, and then waste. And a third of all the food that's produced is wasted in the system. So an organization, the um, an NGO called Grain, looked at this whole system in 2011 and looked at the from all the parts of it. And they estimated half of climate change emissions come from the industrial agriculture system globally. And then last year, the IPCC finally looked at um, the industrial agricultural system or the global food system and they um estimated a third of emissions come from the food system but they acknowledged that they hadn't looked at the transport components very well and what does this mean for us in southern and eastern africa um it means extreme weather and we had um cyclone i die last year that had terrible consequences in our region in South Africa, we are also seeing extreme droughts. So even um, this year still, there's areas that haven't received rain and um, people have no water to drink. And we can see that as climate change progresses, this is going to become worse. And in Africa, the impact of climate change is predicted to be in some places double what it will be in other areas. So if we're seeing a two degree rise in Europe, for example, um, where a lot of the emissions are generated in Africa, it will be a four degree change in our temperature, leading to extreme weather of both drought and extreme um, rainfall. The other big impact is on our water. So not only will we not have water, but the whole industrial model creates very polluted water. And this is an example from the US, from the Mississippi River Basin. And that Mississippi River drains from a, a, a very intense in, um, farming belt in the USA. And what's been happening is that all the fertilizer and chemicals draining off from the agriculture go into the Mississippi River and then into the Gulf of Mexico. And at, as you can see, the blue at the bottom is where the sea is dying off from um, the, that goes into from the, um, the fertilizer pollution. The industrial agriculture system also displaces the diverse agroecosystems that we've had. So through that, um, it's, it replaces or displaces natural ecosystems and our, our local food systems. And with that, we lose our farmer's seed, we lose the, the wild spaces that we gather food, medicine, building material, craft material from the spaces that we are culturally identified with and where we um, um, practice our spirituality. And through that, we also are losing our connection, connection with our culture and traditional knowledge. And often when we um, say we need a change in the food system, the rhetoric that comes back or the narrative that comes back is that we need the industrial food system to feed a growing population. And this feed the world narrative is often used as an excuse to keep perpetuating the same system. But if you look at the actual information and stats, and the next three graphs I'm showing you come from the um, FAO's state of food insecurity in the world reports that come out every year, you actually see that the hunger is increasing and the food insecurity is increasing but it's not um, related to production. So production is also increasing of these commodity crops, but it's not addressing the hunger situation. So since um, 2014, we've seen a reversal where um, hunger was going down. It's now starting to go up again and food insecurity is going up. And with COVID this year, it's going to jump a whole lot and um, know what's happening in our communities around not being able to access food. Other part of it is that malnutrition is, including, is, is increasing. 
And when we look at malnutrition, it's not only wasting and stunting um, from having too little food. It's also the flip, coin, flip side of the coin, which includes things like obesity, diabetes, those diseases that are coming into our societies because of bad food. So this is a graph from this year's Sophie report where it's looking at um, the, the poverty line and people can afford starchy foods. They can afford those high calorie foods. But what people are not affording is a good new, um, a diet that's nutrient adequate or even healthy. So the graph at the bottom is showing you countries that can't afford, the darker they are, an adequate nutrient rich diet. And as a con consequence, we're getting these um, diseases related to malnutrition. The other impact is that we're losing both biodiversity and agricultural diversity. So we um, rely on just 200 um, crop species for most of our food and nine, only nine of these account for 66% of current crop production. So we're very um, insecure in terms of our resilience, equally losing our, life, uh, our livestock breeds that are adapted to local conditions. We also are losing biodiversity, which is also very important for agriculture. So again, last year, there was a big um, report on the loss of biodiversity and the ecosystems that um, fauna and flora need. And of great concern is the loss of um, insect species that are important for crop pollination, such as bees. And the drivers for that biodiversity loss are this, um, industrial agriculture and um, agrochemical pollutants and climate change. And as we've seen, there's a close relationship between climate change and, and the industrial agricultural system. As a result of that, we're seeing um, all sorts of diseases. So last year we had the listeriosis outbreak that um, affected us in terms of processed food. This year, we're seeing the um, coronavirus pandemic, um, which is, is a symptom of a, a system that's out of balance, where we're encroaching on our spaces, and it's having a very direct impact on our food security and food systems. So not only is it making us hungry, but it's also exposed the fragility of our food system and the importance of the informal trade sector and small producers and actually feeding people. And when that is clamped down as it has been in our lockdown, many, many people go hungry. And this last slide I want to show you um, from IPES Food, who made that short ducky. Um, and this is um, looking at, it's from one of their reports, looking at the lock-ins that bind us to this um, very destructive agriculture system. And some of those at the center of it is the concentration of power and the power of corporations to influence our governments. But it's also um, dependency on the existing path, the export orientation of our, of our agriculture sector, a, an expect expectation of cheap food. Um, although that's a little bit of a tricky one because we often don't have a choice and producers are paid very badly. So it's about how we shorten that, um, that link. It's the feed the world narrative, our compartmentalized thinking, short-term thinking, especially of, of decision makers, and the way that we measure this. So we measure it just in trade and not in health and well-being of communities. So we really need to switch to agroecology as a climate resilient food system that restores a healthy relationship both with nature and each other. Thank you. So let me stop the screen share and now we're going to go into our next part of, of this session, which is looking at um, agroecology and why we need agroecology from the perspective of farmers. And Nick's going to play you some inserts from farmers contributed. And you'll be hearing from Mavis and Hleko, who is an agroecological farmer supported by Biowatch in Pongola in Northern KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. Um, we're also going to be hearing from Nelson Mudua, who is the National Coordinator for the Zimbabwe Smallholder Organic Farmers Forum. 
and then from Elizabeth Mpofu, who is the chair of ZIMSOF, but also the general coordinator of La Via Campesina. Um, and some of the snippets come from um, the Harare Good Food Festival, which some of the Sky partners were involved in hosting recently. So thanks, Nick. Maybe see one tail or pong on. Young and I'm a belling bamboo. Yeah, the man, the man is finish. And you need to carry your tea, be true tea. The matis in that in Yami, yeah, the Alleen Ya Chabula Kulu in Sana Mandutin Bime, Ya Fisa Kulu Wuti, Abanyo Mama, Mbafun Bise, Wuti Badi Majingan, Nabu Bapilin in the Nabu, Basi Ubu Fun in Pino. As farmers, we are finding it very difficult to produce our diverse foods that have been produced um, uh, for the past generations. Many of our forefathers were just eating uh, food that we, they were just producing from their land at uh, zero cost. But now with the introduction of conventional agriculture, we are fi finding that the cost of production on a hectare is just doubled or even uh, increased beyond reach of many small farmers. If you look at the weather pattern, we realize that the, the climate is changing every season after season and we seeing droughts, we seeing floods, we seeing lots of erosion of that topsoil that we need to produce our, our food going in millions of tons. We failing to even feed our livestock, grazing is disappearing and even other trees are just drying in the forest because the environment is changing and things are almost like upside down from the farmer's perspective, perspective, perspective. But agroecology is the solution to all these challenges because it is a very broad kind of an approach that is just uh, at a very no cost to any farmer who would wa uh, want to reconnect to the past and then begin to manage the soil, begin to manage the water and begin to manage uh, the seed resources that our forefathers have been using for the past generations and begin a process that has to connect to other farmers that are within the neighborhood by showcasing the best practices and inviting others. We believe if we are at farmer level, others can learn from uh, another farmer who could be outperforming their activities on the ground by simply connecting the practices together. It's those that feel that what we are doing is a positive change to the environment, is a positive change to increasing 
food production is a positive change to increasing nutrition and also a positive change to connecting ourselves to the global economies because we begin by feeding ourselves and rejuvenating our local economies through the practice of agroecology and we also seen lots of other positive uh, examples coming where water is managed well we seeing water ground underground water increasing levels and we seeing increasing plant diversity and we seeing uh, increasing stability of the environment in general so these practices if you look at it from a very deep sense agroecology is almost like the solution to the climate crisis and it's almost a solution to the nutritional needs that many uh, households would require and even those suffering from chronic diseases can benefit quite a lot from that diverse food which can be produced through agroecological methods. Seed has become one of the core element of our food systems. Without seed you cannot produce food and without seed you, c you are not able even to generate any form of livelihood especially being a small older farmer like myself and we have given lots of values over uh, recovering all the local seed diversity because that's where we, we're getting lots of the nutrition that we require at the present moment. We need to eat healthy food. So healthy food is only out of the diverse seed resources that have been grown by our forefathers long before. If I can just briefly explain about the difference of food sovereignty and food security. When we grew up, we were just hearing the issue of food security, food security, which means we just need abundance of food, not necessarily taking into consideration where it is produced, how it is produced. Now, with food sovereignty, this means you are in control of your own food production systems. You can also decide on how you really want to produce the food. This is food sovereignty. We don't really necessarily encourage food security. That is why we are really fighting for food sovereignty. We want to produce our own, using our own natural resources, what is surrounding us, and making decisions on how we really want to produce, apart from food security, where we are just being uh, given some food aid which are not really healthy to the people which are not really we don't know what what they can cause to the uh, healthy system and we are experiencing so many diseases due to consumption of different foods which are which come uh, as food aid in our country so food sovereignty you are the one who makes decision what to grow and how you want to grow. Thank you, Nick. Um, now we're going to take a, a 10 minute break. So it's 26 past one, if we can come back at 1.36 on the dot. Thank you. I hope you had a refreshing break, though short, but uh, now we're ready to uh, go on into the, the, uh, the fourth session, I think. Uh, so in this session, we will be talking about um, agroecology through the different aspects of agroecology. Uh, such as, uh, as Gertrude was going to present the indigenous knowledge and culture systems, as well as spirituality. And then we also have uh, science and knowledge, agroecology in, in those aspects. And then we also talk about nutrition and biodiversity, as well as uh, localizing uh, agroecology systems. Uh, and then we have a specific example of uh, Johannesburg. And then we'll also talk about engaging and uh, youth in agroecology as well as gender and then uh, agroecology on the landscape level and then we'll also talk about how do we transition uh, into agroecology so we have uh, a wide number of pre-recorded speakers that will be uh, uh, joining us today some of them are actually with us as participants 
but uh, we pre-recorded them earlier and we'll be playing you uh, different videos. Uh, we'll go straight to Gertrude. Uh, Gertrude will be talking to us about uh, indigenous knowledge, spirituality and culture in agroecology. And Gertrude is from Pelham in Zimbabwe. I think maybe my starting point would come from from sharing the views of uh, indigenous people and uh, also speaking from an African context as well. So most of the things that we are doing under agroecology is meant to restore balance which has been lost. And that is very much the understanding of um, indigenous people that order has been lost. The order has been lost and that there is a lot of disconnection in our current system. A disconnection of human beings from participating in the broader system that's much complex. And because of the disconnection that has happened, human beings have removed themselves from being part of a much bigger family, what we would call the Earth family. And they have removed themselves and come in to dominate other life forms. There is need to bring in the indigenous knowledge and wisdom in the agroecology discussions, why we need to remember and go back to roots and tap into the indigenous wisdom and knowledge to begin to really reconnect with the other forms of life in, in the restoration of balance um on 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 earth which is our life support system so perhaps people would then start to ask why why then should we should we understand or bring in the conversation of indigenous knowledge the spirituality component and culture are we not going backwards or are we not um taking ourselves from from progressing but i would say that the conversations and the understanding of indigenous knowledge and spirituality, including culture, is very much modern. And if you go back to science and what science is telling us, they are really coming, coming up with information to just strengthen what indigenous people have been saying for many years. So an understanding that I also got uh, by just being a student um, studying at jurisprudence is that indigenous people were really connected to Mother Earth. They understood that Earth is alive. It also possesses a spirit which is called Anima Mundi. And this spirit makes you open your eyes to seeing that life, you are sur surrounded by many beings with different life forms manifesting as either birds, as insects, as trees, as water. All these beings that surround us possess a form of, of, of they, they, they are held and uh, they exhibit this anima, spirit, uh, anima mundi spirit in them. And you also find it in human beings and in animals. So, everything on planet earth possesses this this spirit and because our forefathers and our ancestors spent more time in nature they got very much exposed to this great spirit anima mundi which taught them how to live in harmony with other life forms so then this also brings in the component on language how in our discussion, we always talk about resources, which is quite different from how indigenous people re um, refer to other life forms. They are not resources, but rather they are brothers, they are sisters, they are great great grandparents or their uncles. And you'd find that shifting the language to, to view other beings in, in our life support systems is our relatives you begin to treat them in a different way. So when you go to a forest, you don't see timber, but you see trees with life because we are connected to the trees. 
when you go to a river, you don't see yourself abusing or taking more than what is needed from the river and damming and making reservoirs just to benefit the human beings. There is a relationship and the respect to say a river also has the right to flow. It has to the right to complete its journey because a river is on a journey. So that understanding that was brought in by indigenous people to relate to a much complex system enabled them to live in harmony with nature. And we find that even in our traditional communities, particularly when you dig deep into customary governance system in the management of collective commons. For instance, in Zimbabwe, the chief um, where would actually find someone who would go in a forest and just cut down trees run, uh, and cause deforestation. Because within the customary governance system of the Shona people, it is forbidden to just take an axe and go and cut a tree because it is seen as someone who's also committing um, murder, I would put it in courts, because you are actually killing a life form that has the right to exist. So just moving on to, to that, there is also um, the recognition that staying closer to nature enabled the indigenous people and communities to develop their um, spirituality and also their culture. Um, particularly when you're looking at um, staying closer to nature because from nature, this is where they got the law. The indigenous people really understand that the way earth is governed is governed by one law. And it is from this law that other laws come. So being governed by that great law enabled indigenous communities to relate with other beings and have a, a relationship of equals or human beings participating in this dance of life as subjects. Something that Thomas Berry talks about that we really need to, to go back to our senses and beginning to and begin to participate in the dance of life as subjects in a much complex system. And then looking at how indigenous people related to nature, you'd find that the laws that were then developed by a community, those customary governance system were then developed to, to, to allow communities to manage collective commons. So the understanding of indigenous people is that they do not own any form of life on earth but rather they are custodians. So something that's quite different from, from how the industrial system sees our relationship to, to other forms of life. So in the industrial system, someone buys land and owns it, which, which is unheard of in, 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 in traditional communities that are really rooted in their culture their spirituality and also to the law. Because according to indigenous knowledge and wisdom, you can never own another life form, but you can only be a custodian. So we can never own trees, we can never own soil, we can never own the sun, but we can only participate just like how other, other beings are participating. So looking at the why we need to recognize the importance of indigenous knowledge, spirituality, and culture in agroecology, I would say that it gives us a path to reconnect to our senses. It allows us to go back to root and really understand who we are in a much complex system. Tapping into indigenous knowledge and wisdom will help us to participate in the dance of life without having to dominate other beings. It will also help us to shift our language and to begin a conversation um, in protecting other life forms. So we don't see mountains as quarry, but we can see them as our ancestors, our grandmothers, our fathers, 
our our sisters really having that relationship of equals, knowing that without them we cannot exist. Thank you, Stephanie. So we move on to the next one, agroecology from the perspective of science and knowledge. Uh, so we'll have um, Maya Mashak from the University of Cape Town, the Department of Environmental and Geographical Science. Thank you, Maya. Hi, everyone. Um, so this is just a quick presentation on the theme of agroecology and science. Um, you probably would have already spoken about agroecology and its different dimensions and the way it's seen as being a science, a practice and a social movement. So much more than a science, but I'm going to focus on that, although it's all connected. So a good place I thought to start would be to look at the concept of modernist science and the role that that has played in shaping agriculture and in the world and in the global south. Um, so since the European Enlightenment began in the 16th and 17th century, there's this idea that science could unlock the secrets of nature and reality, and that other ways of knowing that weren't science should be measured against the, the so-called truth of science. Um, and in, in this period, there's this, this idea took shape, which is often called a dualist ontology, which in which humans and nature started to be seen as separate rather than interconnected. So a more organic way of seeing the world got replaced by a more me mechanistic way of seeing the world. And this idea that nature could be put to work. And this idea, um, this kind of modernist way of thinking and colonialism, colonialism are seen as co-constituted by decolonial theorists. So one shaping the other. Um, and they talk about how the sciences um, including agricultural science, played a significant part in shaping colonial power and control. Um, and this idea that modernist thought carried on past the colonial period in, um, into the structures and institutions, um, the capitalist and development of genders and, and decolonial theorists talk about this as coloniality, which continues into the present. Um, and we see this within the Green Revolution approaches to agriculture, in which are based very much on separation between humans and nature and this control over nature and extractive way of doing agriculture and a disregard for other ways of doing agriculture, other ways and knowledges. Um, and there's this idea in the development paradigm for a long time that this was the only way to solve food insecurity and poverty and issues of our time. Um, especially in the face of population growth and climate change. This idea that only science can do that. Um, and so um, post-colonial and decolonial activists and theorists um, have looked at how modernist ontology has underpinned so much of the social and ecological injustices that we face today. And they work to decenter um, this modernist thought. In doing so, they draw in non dualist philosophies and indigenous knowledges um, that have been so op uh, opposed and oppressed through colonialism and capitalism and development. Um, these are the ways of knowing that reflect a deeply relational understanding of life. Um, and then uh, the Susan Santos talks about how we can't um, rely on the thought that got, that created the problems, that we need different ways of thinking and different maps. Um, so agroecology offers a different map, but often a different way of thinking about agriculture, drawing on the knowledge of um, pre-modernist thought and of people at this time who still know how to connect with nature and how to work in this way and it works towards developing these relationships with nature. Um, industrial agricultural science um, prioritizes yield and profit. It's about extraction. Um, research is often done by scientists outside of the environments in which it will be used. And they, there's this development of generic solutions such as um, broad spectrum herbicides and pesticides and GM traits in which you don't have you, you don't have to develop the knowledge to use them and they come with it. So there's this idea of technology transfer in a unidirectional way from science to farmers, rather than seeing farmers as co-creators of knowledge, farmers are seen as recipients of technologies. And the research agenda is increasingly corporate led. By contrast, agroecology as a science prioritizes productive systems, but also ecological justice and well-being. Agriculture is seen as social, eco, social ecological intrinsically and farmers' knowledge is centered 
and um, farmers should be setting the research agenda. It also prioritizes local place-based solutions and relational solutions um, that are important in each context. It reconnects farmers and scientists this way, both with e agroecosystems, and it's open in an interdisciplinary way to, to different ways of knowing and, and tackling um, each problem and working towards sustainable solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so that was uh, agroecology as a science. Um, so we move on to the next one which is on nutrition and biodiversity. We'll get a chance at the end when we get into our groups to discuss these presentations more. So keep the questions. You can write them in the chat box. My name is Juliet Nalambalua. I'm from Zambia. I work with Community Technology Development Trust, and I'll be sharing on agroecological perspective on nutrition and biodiversity. Just to, brief, to give a brief overview on this uh, topic. So the main challenge that we're seeing is that around the world, our diets are changing very rapidly. They are becoming more and more uniform. Um, with a very limited number of plant and animal species that are contributing to our diets. We also see that crop production has narrowed down to a very limited number of plant species and the way that the crops are produced, the way that the crops are utilized has changed. This has led to issues around malnutrition and loss of biodiversity. Biodiversity of plants as well as biodiversity of animals because ecosystems are disturbed that contribute to crop production. We see that malnutrition is presenting itself in form of stunting, wasting, obesity and non-communicable diseases. In Zambia, for example, we see that a population that is between 17 million to 18 million, 35% of them are affected by stunting. Malnutrition has got a long lasting impact on people that it, it affects and also presenting other issues, other problems uh, for those people that are affected by malnutrition. In this regard, we see agroecology as an avenue through which nutrition problems, uh, biodiversity problems can be addressed. This is because agroecology um, supports and addresses species diversification of both plants and animals. This science, this science or practice also supports um, beneficial biological interactions from soil to gut, hence allowing for functional biodiversity for food and nutrition security. Okay, so we move on to a third video, which is going to tackle um, new, uh, not nutrition, but uh, localizing agroecology production. And we have a case of Johannesburg. And so we have Dora Malema from Ubuntu Project. It's also pre-recorded. Um, greetings, everyone. Um, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Dora. I'm presenting about the Ubuntu Project. Um, the Ubuntu project was initiated by the Green Business College and Seed Community um, in March 2020, at the beginning of the lockdown in South Africa. Um, really, the main aim of this project was to connect um, agroecology farmers in Johannesburg, specifically Region G of Johannesburg, to uh, the communities who were without food at the beginning of the lockdown. Initially, we started working with um, with uh, Tim Ava, who was just the, the farmer that we had worked with within uh, with the Green Business College, and and soon enough, um, his produce on the farm um, was then finished, and he had to go and mobilize other farmers in the neighboring areas of where he is farming in Akenoff in Johannesburg Region G. He started to work with them and. Uh, 
his farm served as a central place where the the produce was uh, was brought in and packed in the boxes um, that were distributed in the neighboring informal settlements of um, um, Akenov, um, Jovicho, uh, Enedale, um, Chicken Farm, and others. In total, there were in total there were twelve of those communities. Uh, he worked with. Um, community champions to identify families that would receive this uh this this ubuntu boxes um we then later on decided to actually add the seedlings and the compost and the seeds including a, a magazine that team was distributing and the major reason for that was because there were a lot of um people who really were keen to start growing their food um, so as we went around distributing um, uh, the fresh produce, we realized that the people who could be able to benefit from actually receiving the from receiving the the, the seedlings and the compost. And um, yeah, I think we assisted close to three thousand families in that area, and they have since been able to start producing their own vegetables. Some of them started to produce their own seedlings. Um, yeah, and we added a bit of training uh, to this project as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. That was a beautiful example of localizing uh, uh, agroecology in one community. Um, so we move on to another pre-recorded video uh, from uh, Zambia, this time from uh, Scope Zambia. You're muted, Tifundo, your microphone is on mute. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right. So I was saying we're going to be going to Zambia where any Chikangi from Scope Zambia is going to be talking about uh, the inclusion of youth in agroecology. My name is Ani Chikanji. I'm the national coordinator in Zambia. I work with the RESCOP, which is regional schools and colleges from Akaucho, uh, supporting Sky initiative for uh, work which do with the seed in schools. And why do we work in schools? We always believe that we need to catch them young. By catching them young, is that young people are very easy to work with. Whatever you tell them, they will actually implement. They will actually send the message to their families to the, about what they have learned. For example, if they have learned about mouching, they will actually go home and say, today we learned about mouching. New word has come to the family, and the family would work to see what that mouching is all about. When they come to the school, we do demonstrations. So demonstration of a different way of growing locally available materials like sorghum, uh, cowpeas, and fruit, bananas. Because this, the thing is, the children, they come home from home without on an empty stomach. When they come to, to the school as, as well, they are taught uh, in their just theory and the, there's no uh, linkages of from the, the real life as well as paperwork. What this program does is that they will inter interact with it, they will learn about it, they will grow the food, and then they will showcase the community to say, this is what we are doing. By doing that, they will get to know the real life, and once they leave the school, they will never struggle. Why schools? We use the schools also because the land is available, and the, the land is owned by the whole community, all the government. So it is easy for us to showcase the work of uh, the seed work in schools. We are also uh, promoting this with the young people because young people, as we said, they actually can, uh, they are the future of uh, leadership. So if we want good governance, it will only come by those who understand the environment, good environment, and unless they are doing it at schools, not theory but practice. So if one to, to learn 
we teach young people about uh, environmental science in real life. See the initiative is actually helping the children to see this as a reality. Thank you, Annie from Zambia, who was talking about uh, working with youth. Now uh, we move on to Esther Lupafia, who's with the Soils, Food and Healthy Communities uh, in Malawi, uh, also with her pre-recorded um, video talking about uh, gender and inclusivity. I am Esther Lupafia, working with the Soils, Food and Health Communities at the Gwenden northern part of Malawi, SFHC. I'm going to present about uh, agroecology and gender. I'm presenting on transforming gender through agriculture. This was a case study for SFHC in the Gwenden northern part of Malawi, which showed improve the food security and nutrition with legume diversification. Then a follow-up study with 400 highly food insecure households doing agroecology experiments found positive impact on food security and nutrition for households using agroecology, agroecological methods and sharing knowledge with his spouse. The results were diversification can improve child growth with participatory approaches. Attention to this graph is showing child growth in first year participating village, participating households versus non-participating villages. What we used was measuring child weight using age for weight and using the Z score. And it showed that the people who were participating in, this, um, in these approaches, their children were growing better than those who were not participating in these uh, approaches. Then we had four ways to empower women through agriculture. The first one was holistic agroecological approach, addressing food security, nutrition, livelihood, and health. The second one, explicit attention to inequalities at multiple scales. The third one was participatory methods and dialogue approach that respect local knowledge and culture. The fourth one was addressing big issues that shape women's choices, not just at community level. Conclusion from SFAC case study was agroecology can be used to improve food security and build more resilient social and ecological systems when combined with farmer red experimentation and attention to social inequalities. Then crop diversity, especially legumes and use of organic material to improve soil fertility, key methods. Then use of flexible participatory approaches for farmers to test different strategies that fit their situation. Then dialogue approaches with multiple ways to discuss issues, e.g. dramas, meetings, small discussion groups. Then to sustain food transitions needed to address broader social inequalities, e.g. land access, right to save seed, climate change. Uh, thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Thank you very much, e e Esther from SFHC. Um, was talking about addressing uh, issues with to do with gender and inclusivity. So now we move on to agroecology at a landscape level, and the presenter will be Mugovewo Tanyika from. Uh, the regional schools and colleges permaculture 
program in Zambia. Also pre recorded. That's um, working um, to promote agroecology at landscape level means that um, we are looking at uh, the broader uh, landscape. And that means that um, we are going beyond individual farms and individual um, uh, units of land, for example, those that belong to schools, uh, going beyond that to look at um, the whole area that is uh, drained by a particular stream or river. Uh, we are looking at um, um, area that includes not just the, the farms that are farmed by uh, individual farmers, but also the commons, the areas that are used by a community uh, together. Uh, such areas may, might include the pastures where the community graze the animals. Such areas might include um, the forests um, where communities sometimes get wild harvest. So we are looking at um, the bigger landscape that um, is occupied by a particular community. And the size of this um, um, landscape can vary from uh, area to area. In some areas, it could be the area that is um, uh, used by a particular village under a village headman. Uh, and in some areas, it could be much bigger, um, including several villages uh, under a chiefdom. And, um, when we work with such big area, what we are doing is to implement the agroecological uh, principles and practices on that whole landscape um, and working with the whole community to uh, try to regenerate that broader landscape. It is important to uh, move to working at landscape level because uh, it's not enough to have um, green islands um, like individual farms that are uh, applying agroecology well um, because um, we need to have an impact on the water cycle and to have an impact on the water cycle we need to uh, broaden our area of work uh, in a particular location so that, uh, for example, we can uh, more um, easily influence the soil erosion, which is a, a challenge in our region, um, siltation, and um, we can move towards regenerating um, the rivers and streams, many of which are now seasonal when they used to be perennial. Uh, so to have an impact on water catchments, it's important to work at um, landscape level. So once we do that, we can uh, also start um, increasing our climate action because um, uh, in these days we have the climate emergency um, where climate change is uh, something that we need to to address, but the benefits go beyond um, this to also the communities because um, if we manage to regenerate uh, whole landscapes, it means, for example, we can revive uh, springs that can improve the supply of water to communities, clean water to communities and uh, communities can have um, also access to more wild harvests, such as uh, mushrooms and, and um, honey, uh, because the bigger landscape will become much more productive. Uh, so there are a number of reasons um, why it is important to uh, scale up our work to the agroecology at landscape level. But um, I should also add that um, um, 
landscape level work is also important in terms of our food security and nutrition security because uh, when we make the whole landscape productive it means we are diversifying the sources of food which is important for food security and then um, when we diversify the sources of food we are also improving nutrition uh, security and at the same time will also be improving income security because communities will have um, uh, wider sources of um, income and uh, so we'll also therefore improve the livelihoods in the communities it is an initiative that um, will hopefully benefit uh, the whole community of practice and will lead to this work being um, adopted by more and more communities so that um, our impact can start uh, moving towards um, being a, a regional uh, impact trying to influence uh, big water catchments and uh, eventually bioregions. Thank you, it is uh, my pleasure. Thank you, Walter. Um, for our last presentation, uh, we're going to have a, a presentation on scaling agroecology uh, as a transition, scaling up agroecology as a transition process. And it is the Groundswell team um, with Peter Goebbels and Mr. Twamba leading this discussion. Oh, they are going to present for us, not leading. Greetings from Ghana. My name is Peter and I'll be sharing with you nine messages about how to scale out agroecology as a transition process. I'll do that through some slides, so give me a minute. And I will start the presentation. There we go. So my, the basic question I'll be trying to answer during this session is how can civil society organizations effectively support the scaling out of agroecology? Well, my first key message is that there is an urgent need to scale out agroecology to deal with, in many areas, is a land degradation and climate crisis. And in many countries, we are far from learning how to effectively scale out agroecology, and we still have a lot to learn about how to do it well. So what are some of the issues in scaling agroecology? Well, first of all, it has to be context specific. It's not the same set of things that you do in every uh, place. Um, it's highly knowledge intensive, and it's much more than just spreading or training farmers on one or two techniques like compost. The aim is really to uh, spread a process by which farmers can develop a, a resilient and sustainable farming system. So what has to be scaled in addition to techniques? Well, there are many social, cultural, and institutional issues that you have to take into account beyond the training of, of farmers on, on agroecology in the process of scaling. So what are some of these strategies? Well, first of all, it has to be a progressive process. So yes, you have to start simple, start slow and start simple with one or two or three innovations, but then you need to look at, in addition to those, how can you build on other uh, agroecological innovations like in the second wave and then a third wave, you can't do everything all at once but you can't stop with the first two or three either. Another key message is that as you start scaling out the agroecology movement or, or um, process, you have to take into account equity issues. That means that you should be monitoring to ensure that the, mo the most vulnerable households and especially women in those households are not being left behind. The third strategy is that Scaling almost always requires strengthening local capacity and local governance, both at the local government level, but especially at the community level, in order to lead and manage the scaling up process 
building on their own uh, sense of ownership. So taking agroecology innovations to scale is just not feasible unless there's some sort of often massive mobilization of communities themselves to, to fully engage in the process. And that is through farmer to farmer. The last message is that if you want to take it to scale, you have to have successful examples and programs that work, but then you have to leverage those programs to inspire and catalyze a wider process through the whole country. So you're bringing together and convening many other organizations that are like-minded and doing similar things and to learn from each other. So those are my key messages. If you want to, I've written up a number of case studies on scaling. If you want to learn more uh, or get this slide presentation, you see my email there. And I wish you a very successful workshop. Thank you very much to the Groundswell team. And uh, that was the last uh, of our snippets. Um, we would like to thank all the presenters who shared with us their immense knowledge on uh, the aspects on agroecology, on youth, on gender, on uh, scaling up, on localizing production. We learned quite a lot and uh, had great examples from across the continent. Um, so now we hand, I hand over to Steph for the last session. Thanks, thanks very much, Fundo. Um, yeah, so we're getting towards the end of our program, um, but we, as you probably realized, we're a bit um, behind time. Um, if, if you don't mind, we could, we're probably going to go a bit um, over time, uh, but uh, we expect to finish in the next 30 minutes or so. So this is the last session of our program. And as you remember, uh, the last session is, is about um, reflecting a bit on, on what was said during the, the, the two hours, um, the key learnings that you got from it, uh, but also some questions that may have been um, arising from all this, uh, this, this, this sharing. And we will um, do that uh, first in smaller groups so that you can uh, um, have the space the, the, to, to, to share uh, with the other participants and come back to plenary um, uh, to, to share the very, very key learnings that you, that you got. So I'm going to share my, my screen also, um, just to explain how it's going to work. I hope you're seeing my screen. So we'll, we'll split in, two, in three groups. Um, so it will be probably three groups of between eight and 10 people. And um, each one of us, uh, the, the, the moderators, Chifundo, Vanessa and myself will join a group uh, and we'll have 15 minutes to share in the group. So uh, Nick is going to explain how to join the group. Uh, he's going to manage that. Once you... Uh, uh, except you go to the group and you are in the group session and everybody is there, um, maybe just a round of introductions so that you know who else is in the group, but very quickly. Then decide on a rapporteur, the person who's going to um, share um, in the plenary, the, the main outcome of your discussion. Um, and, um, and then start the discussion. So the round two, two, two questions, key learnings, but also maybe inspiration from the presentations and the videos and any pending questions that you, you, you had before, you still have them or any new questions. Then after 15 minutes and you will be prompt, you know, it will, there will be a timer to tell you where you're at in terms of what time. But at the end of the 15 minutes, you will be brought back automatically into the plenary. So really you, know, you have to, uh, to, 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 to manage your time well. And back in plenary, um, we'll ask the rapporteur of each group to share three key learnings and two main questions. And each of the rapporteur will have three minutes so that it doesn't, it doesn't um, uh, last for too long. So that's the group session. And after that, we'll just do a quick uh, closing, also um, informing, you, informing you about the next webinar.
So over to you, Nick, to organize uh, the groups. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, hello, everyone. So just to reiterate, reiterate some, of, some of what uh, Stephanie has said, um, everyone's going to be assigned to one of three breakout rooms. Uh, I've, it should all be automated. So when I initiate them, you should be yoinked out of this main plenary room and put into um, one of the breakout rooms uh, for, for your discussion and sharing, sharing session. Um, each room will have a, a lead to guide you. Uh, the session should be about 15 minutes. Um, and once again, it should be automated that once that's up, you will be pulled out uh, and back into the plenary. For those who are currently watching the live stream or are viewing this as a recording at a later stage, uh, your stream or your viewing will be focused on the plenary where I'm going to be running um, an AE for the 21st Century Conference uh, video from a conference that was held in Cape Town in 2018. So the plenaries, so the uh, breakout rooms will not be streamed or recorded. Um, it will only be the plenary. So just to reiterate, um, don't be disconcerted when Zoom shortly loads you into a different session. I'm just going to start that up now. Thank you. Yeah, and you need to accept to go to the group. So please go to the group. <laughs> so we'll see you there. Good um, discussions uh, in your respective groups. It was short, uh, but sweet in mine, uh, for sure. Um, and so now, now um, I give the floor to the rapporteur. Uh, so rapporteur for group number one, and it, it, would it would be nice if you could just switch your camera on. I'm not sure, Nick, group num number one was facilitated by, by who? I think you were the facilitator of- Oh, what? okay. So for my group is Jazaka. <laughs> Go ahead, Jazaka. Okay, so hello everyone. So from the group one discussion that we had, um, a number of interesting stories that arose from our discussion. And one of the things that was mentioned was about how the participants were able to present themselves in terms of their understanding on what agroecology is all about. And one of the, some of the terminologies which people found to be interesting was the mention of restoration as well as the regeneration. So uh, one, one, one of the discussions also was to do with uh, a, lot of, uh, uh, a lot of things are yet to be done in terms of uh, what is agroecology is all about. At the same time, we have issues to do with the Green Deal evolution as well as climate change. And uh, there were some concerns within our discussion to, to say, there is so much to there is so much work to be done. At the same time, time is limited from our side. So, one of the issues was to do with the scaling out. How should we scale up agroecology to the wider audience? At the same time, one of the things uh, also mentioned was to do with uh, uh, the thinking behind agroecology. To say. Uh, agroecology versus the conventional way of doing things, whereby we are saying to say in agroecology, there is less kind of measurement in doing things. So in conclusion, I think there was a question that was, uh, uh, that we discussed also to say, how should we scale out agroecology <laughs> to, uh, in terms of landscaping at a landscaping level? So this is one of the questions that was uh, talked to say, how should we scale up agroecology in terms of landscaping level? I think this is coming from the presentation which uh, Water just uh, presented. I think if I exhausted everything, I hope, I hope maybe I presented almost everything that we discussed. Thanks, Jazaka. Maybe I can also add from my notes um, what came out. It's the power of togetherness, uh, the social aspects that are, are usually forgotten. So, and it came out strongly in, in our webinar. And, and um, it's really key for the transformation that we're seeking. The holistic approach um, and the focus on, on justice also um, and the creativity uh, that, that also came out from our Thank you, Jazaka. Uh, group number two, who is, who is the rapporteur? Group two was Jafundo's group. Okay. 
Yes, so, so I'm reporting back. Okay, go ahead. On that group. Um, so that group, um, I think um, the big thing for people was the, I mean, it was very positive feedback on the presentations and um, the diff all the different, the holistic nature of, of the session. Um, people, quite a few people mentioned the landscape um, presentation, that, that how important that was, you know, in terms of um, that's where the real big damage is happening and um, how important it is to work um, on that level, to, to scale up and scale out. And that it's something, you know, people really like to learn more about. Um, then I think the other question that was raised that how important it is in a way to know the science and the principles I would add to of agroecology because, because not one size fits all. So the, uh, each context is different. So you have to really understand what the science is and what, the, um, you know, if you learn technology like Okashi, your ingredients differ and whatever, how do you adjust and apply? So that, that would be very, very important. Um, yeah, I mentioned was made of the anime of the videos that, um, I think that visual, a good video that visually presents something is a very powerful for all kinds of um, audiences. Um, yeah, and I think the other thing just to summarize is that the, uh, it's the many issues that were the, the issue of solidarity was important to people, um, that it brings so many different issues together. It's such a holistic way of working. Um, I think that, yeah, and to see that everything, um, and that it was inspiring to see some of the evidence being presented by, by people. That's it. Great, thanks, Alfreda. Um, anything else from group number two? Otherwise, we go to group number three. Um, I'm not sure who is the rapporteur for group number three. Um, I'll be presenting for group number three. Okay, go ahead. Cool. Um, so from what we learned, um, there was a realization that we need more cooperation from everyone involved to get a clear understanding of how it works. So more sharing of ideas, more ideas on the table and examples from more um, geographies. And what we also learned was that although we're looking at the different um, aspects of agroecology, based science or youth, they're all related and connected. And there was an insight that for agroecology to be successful, um, there's a need to have buy-in from local government structures, local traditional leadership, or a way to do it in a participatory way that gets um, buy-in and agreement from the communities. And, um, a need to have evidence so that you can lead by example and have examples to motivate people to join into the practice. And on the questions front, what we had were two questions. One was how to get government participation um, involved in these um, practices and particularly interrogating the policy framework as well, in the sense that there seems to be contradicting approaches in policy and um, contradictions in decision-making, so more participation on that front. And the other question was um, how to leverage the role of women in agroecology, particularly if we look at the land ownership trends not being in, the, in favor of women. So how do we leverage the practice in the sense of trying to bring in gender equity? So I'll stop there. Um, and if I missed anything from the team, apologies. Please add in via chat or whatever else. Great, thank you so much, um, Lerato. Um, yeah, so if anybody else from the group 
um, wants to add, but I think it was um, very well um, shared back. Otherwise, thank you very much for um, your participation in this group session and, and, and sharing some of the first reflections that you, you have from this experience. Um, and I'm going to now close um, our webinar. Um, so sharing my screen again, I hope you can see it. Um, I think I seems to be having the same problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is the end of um, our webinar. Thank you so much. The next webinar will be in three weeks time on the 12th of November, same time. Uh, same day, it's also going to be a Thursday. Uh, and the focus of that webinar will be agroecology as a science and a practice or practice. So you will have the opportunity to, um, to interact with our hardcore agroecology practitioners uh, and also um, scientists and knowledge holders uh, in the Sky uh, Initiative. Um, so expect like uh, three hours of a lot of um, technical and scientific information um, but um, in the meantime um, I'll to continue the thinking uh, in preparation for the topic and do a bit of homework so same way as we asked you to think about what is agroecology when you registered uh, this time uh, we want you to go into a natural area and spend some time observing what's happening and especially um, uh, looking at the relationships you see uh, between the different components of what, what you're seeing or what you're experiencing, uh, the patterns maybe you can see. So spend a bit of time uh, doing that, uh, write down any experience um, and then think about how to share with us um, the organizing team this experience. So you could write a few paragraphs or you could take a photograph that is illustrating um, uh, uh, your, your feeling, uh, maybe a drawing, maybe a recording, but just based from your experience, uh, trying to see the connections that are happening um, between the various uh, components of, of uh, what's around you, uh, but also you being part of that, of that system. So I hope it's clear. Otherwise, uh, we'll, we'll just to say it in the in the, the chat box, or we'll send also an email, and we can we can uh, continue uh, the conversation by email. And we're asking you to send it at least a week in advance to Ruby, so the same lady who's been uh, receiving your registration forms, so that we can also um, make a nice compilation and start the next webinar um, with that. So it's for you to start experimenting, experiencing what what's, uh, uh, webinar number two is going to um, um, uh, unpack and, and go deeper into. So that's the homework for the next session. Um, and otherwise, um, I think that's the end. So for the end, I really would like to thank everyone. Uh, my, the organizing Hello. team. Hello, Steve. Yes, sorry. Some, somebody wants to say something? Sorry, I accidentally muted them. To hi, hi. Thanks, thanks, Nicholas. I, I wanted to just to just ask. Um, I, I, I want to to have my team uh, watch this, and I, I just needed to know how we're going to get information about how to get the the recordings for this one and when can we expect it? Yeah, thanks. Actually, I, I was meant to, to say that. So this session was recorded and um, the recording is going to be available on the Sky YouTube channel. Uh, so uh, I think within the next two or three hours, by the end of the day, in any case, we'll have the, um, the recording uploaded on the YouTube channel. And um, I don't know, Nick, maybe if you can put in the chat box the link uh, to the Sky uh, YouTube channel and, and then people can access the recording um, um, from there. 
so that's the idea. I also um, remember at the beginning of the session, people asking for the presentations. Uh, we'll, yeah, we'll think about it, how to maybe put together some key references, the presentations uh, and, and other things and, and share by email, um, maybe by the end of the week or something. So that's for um, the, the, the sharing of um, the recording and, and materials. I don't know, Thank do you want to say something else on that? Thank you so much. Yeah. I just want to say that um, Nick's just got to do some cutting out the breaks and all of that and then load it up again. So it takes a few hours. So please be patient if you don't see it straight away. It just depends on the connectivity as well and loading it up. So look tonight or maybe tomorrow morning for sure. Great, thanks. Yeah. Otherwise, thanks very much, everyone. Yeah. Thanks. So, so um, yeah. So we really hope that you 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 enjoyed the session, that you got a, a good taste of what agroecology is all about, because it's like all about, and a good taste um, while enjoying the first time. So. Um, hi, Steph. Hi. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to butt in once more. I, I, I just thought this was so, so much of a valuable um, uh, contribution to our own development that uh, maybe one uh, wouldn't mind to, um, to actually uh, support something like this financially, even if it wasn't a lot. But um, if, I don't know if that is a possibility that if uh, somebody wanted to uh, maybe make a donation or something like that, it could be made possible to us maybe via email as well, um, just to support what, what you guys have been doing or what you are still going to do in the next two webinars as well. Uh, okay, okay, thanks. Um... Yeah, um, we haven't thought about that. That was not the, the objective, but just put anything, any suggestions, put it in the chat box and then we'll uh, consider it with the rest of the team um, because we hadn't, we hadn't thought about it. Thanks. Okay, so I think it's time to, um, to leave. Um, so for the third time, thanks again to everyone. The, organizing team, the presenters, uh, the whole uh, contributors from Sky and other agroecology agri 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 practitioners. Um, we hope you, you learned a lot, you started learning more about agroecology, maybe realizing um, the vast breadth of it, and also first and foremost, the, the opportunity that it represents in terms of um, um, uh, becoming, you know, the agricultural of the 21st century, the agriculture that we need for our very challenged uh, 21st century. So we'll leave you uh, with um, all these uh, food for thoughts, hopefully, um, and um, we look forward to hosting you again in three weeks' time. We'll be communicating um, in the meantime, and um, yeah, until we meet again, thank, thanks everyone, and um, Keep safe and, and healthy. <laughs>